in partnership with the A&M Consumer and Retail Group, Firework, SPS Commerce, and Subtle. Ranked in the top 10% of all podcasts globally, the Retail Fast Five is the podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but most importantly, a little happier each week too. Today is September 28th, 2023. I'm your host, Ann Mazenga. And I'm Chris Walton. And we are here once again to discuss the most important headlines from the past week that highlight how the physical, digital, and human elements of retail are coming together to shape the future. And joining us today, yes. back, back from their regular month, monthly appearance, are two new and two new, of our yes. favorite consultants from the AM Consumer and Retail Group, Kelly Carey and John Clear. Kelly and John, we're so excited to have you today. Um, Kelly, why don't you start? This is your first time. Yeah. Tell the audience a little bit about you and your background and your role at, at, at AM CRG. Great. Thanks so much, Anne. Hi, everyone. My name is Kelly Carey. I am with the AM Consumer and Retail Group for about five years now. Uh, it's such a great time being with the team, and I've worked really across both consumer and retail industry during my time, primarily focusing in merchandising, working with apparel and beauty brands. Awesome. My favorite topics. We're excited to have you, Kelly. It's going to be Thank great. Thank you. Uh, John, tell the audience a little bit about you. You've joined us for a five insightful minutes, but this is the first time you are gracing the fast five stage. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, yeah that's right. I think I'm going to go with the, the oft quoted long time listener, first time caller approach here. <laughs> yes. Um, so, uh, very happy to be here and thanks for having me. So yeah, I'm also with the consumer retail group as a director. I've been with a and for about two years, um, and prior to working with AM, I spent 10 years in the grocery retail industry. So heavy focus there on merchandising, buying, sourcing, that element of, of the world there. And then since I've been with CRG, I've done a lot of kind of different work, but really focused on that, I would say, retail with food space. So um, both across operations, merchandising, pricing, and uh, really excited about the work that we're achieving so far. And then happy to talk about all these new topics with you guys today. Yes, and John is the big brain on bread when it comes to grocery. But John, I got a bone to pick with you before we get started here, because I oh, heard great. a little bird told me that uh, that you were not too happy with my Irish accent. I think you, I think you, <laughs> I might be paraphrasing here or quoting you that it was the worst Irish accent that you've ever heard. And so, so I have to ask you point blank, like who has the worst Irish accent, me or Tom Cruise in Far and Away? Which one is worse? Which one is actually worse? Uh, that is a really difficult question to answer i'd say they're both I don't so think I bad choose. they're both so bad that i wake <laughs> up at night kind of in cold chills thinking about it chris which is not <laughs> ideal but if i had to choose i would choose you over tom cruise if that makes you feel better <laughs> oh my god oh my god oh my god oh my god well i re i resemble that remark john i resemble that remark oh well done well done my friend all right well and man we're off a grocery shop we're in full season form the the headlines this week we had like nine headlines that we would have been happy to pick on I any know. normal week, you know? I know. It's just the way it works. Well, we're back from grocery shop. You are still alive, thankfully. Barely. Thank you for all yeah. of our listeners who were calling to check in and make sure Chris is okay. He's he's all right. He's here in, in real form today, and we're going to tear up the Fast Five. Tear yeah. up. Should we do this? You guys ready? John, Kelly, you guys ready? Let's yep. hit it. Let's all hit right. It, well, like, like I said, with Grocery Shop now in our rear view, it is time to also set our sights and tell you all about another exciting conference we have planned in our agenda. And I'm talking this time about Manifest, the future of supply chain and logistics. Hands down, and I got to say, it's it's definitely our favorite supply chain conference of the year, without yes. a doubt. Yes. And Manifest... And Oh, and yeah, we go got to see who the guest is, the guest like performer is for this. Oh, movie. right. Yeah. They always have a great performer too. Uh, yeah, yeah. As well. Ludicrous. Yeah. Like who brings yeah. Ludicrous to it? It's not just supply Luda. chain people. This is very important, but Chris continue. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, you're right. Luda, as I call him. Uh, Manifest has also just announced a slew of thought leaders that are set to take the stage in early February. The show is actually the week before the Super Bowl, So you can go to Vegas, stay the weekend, catch the Super Bowl in Vegas. And those include the, C the Chief Supply Chain Officer of Ulta Beauty, Amy Bear Thomas, as well as the Chief Operating Officer of Foot Locker, our former Target colleague, Elliot Rogers. Shout out to Elliot. You can learn in more and save $200 on the current registration rate, which equates to an incredible $800, believe it or not, $800 off the on-site rate by visiting Manifest 
manifestvegas.com slash Omnitalk. That's manifestvegas.com slash Omnitalk. Ann and I will be there with bells on, and we hope you will be there too. All right, without further ado, let's get to today's headlines. In today's Fast Five, we've got news on Kroger breaking ground on what it is calling its first marketplace store. Nike selling refurbished sneakers online. A new initiative out of Best Buy called Best Buy Drops. Albertsons launching its new flash delivery service. But we begin today with big news from the government. No surprise to anyone probably listening already concerning Amazon and Yes. All right. Headline number one, the Federal Trade Commission and attorneys general from 17 states on Tuesday sued Amazon alleging anti-competitive practices. According to Retail Dive, the FTC chair Lena Khan said in a statement, quote, the complaint sets forth detailed allegations noting how Amazon is now exploiting its monopoly power to enrich itself while raising prices and degrading service for the tens of millions of American families who shop on its platform and the hundreds of thousands of businesses that rely on Amazon. Amazon to reach them, end quote. Amazon tactics the uh, FTC describes as problematic include replacing relevant organic search results with paid advertisements and prioritizing its own products above items that it knows are superior, along with what the FTC calls anti-discounting measures, including a practice of pushing sellers down search results if they offer lower prices elsewhere compared to what they advertise on Amazon, including on their own websites. Uh, John, we're going to go to you first here. Is there merit to this lawsuit? I feel like we are always hearing about companies complaining about Amazon, consumers complaining about Amazon because of this topic. But if if this there is merit to this, what does it mean for the retail industry more broadly? Yeah, I, I think there's kind of lots of different angles and layers to this, yeah. which is super interesting. Um, and, and I will also, I think it's, it's also important for me to know I'm not an, an FTC expert, right? But <laughs> from my per, from my perspective, I think the hits keep coming for Amazon really is, is the first point here. They're kind of mm-hmm. getting it from all angles at the moment. Um, I, I don't know if it's as big a topic as it once was because there's now more competition against Amazon than there was even six or nine months ago, right? If we right. think about, yeah. for, exa- for example, Timu, which is now mm-hmm. basically cutting out Amazon in the middle and coming directly to consumers. And yeah. that is now the most downloaded app in the app store this year. So it's a huge um, push from that perspective to customers. So so I think the more the more interesting point for me about whether this has merit or not is that it's a continuation of the FTC and how they're getting more aggressive on what they're terming monopolistic practices, right? So, so obviously this is a big decision with the state's attorney generals um, supporting it too. And they have a huge decision coming down the track with Kroger Albertsons as well. Mm-hmm. So I think the FTC are really doubling down on this idea that they're protecting the consumer. And that's very interesting for the retail industry more broadly at how they approach things, because it is a bit of a shift in mindset towards making sure the consumer is at the center of decisions and that they're getting the best deals. And I think you're going to see more and more activity in this space from the FTC, not just to prevent monopolistic practices, but to put the consumer at the center of this and make sure that everyone's getting a fair deal. Yeah. Kelly, I see you nodding along. Anything you'd, you'd add into what John just outlined? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's going to be so interesting to see how this plays out. And again, in my non-legal opinion, I think there's really two things they have to prove here. You know, are they unreasonably excluding other companies and impairing their ability to compete? I think there's a lot of grounds and merit there and things to investigate. But Mm -hmm. the question of is Amazon creating a worse experience for the consumer? I'm really curious to see how they prove that out in particular. Um, I think that they've really created such a new space for the consumer here. So, yeah. uh, you know, are they actually making my experience worse when I'm getting a easy Amazon basics product top of my feed? No hassle. I don't know. I'm curious to right. see how it plays out. Right. Chris, I want to hear what your yeah. perspective is because I, I, I mean, I'm curious, like uh-huh. this is Amazon. What, what happens if like back in the day you tried to do this 
at Target or, at, yeah. you know, if somebody tried to do this at Walmart, like what would that look like? Yeah. I'm not an FTC expert, but I, yeah, no, I am a retail expert and I am kind of a merchandising expert too. I mean, spent 20 years in merchandising too. I, I mean, feel like we need a disclaimer, like running across the bottom of it. <laughs> right, like, right. This is not <laughs> legal <laughs> advice. Not this experts. is not an FTC expert speaking, but yeah. hypothetically, Chris. But I, but just, I, but just, I think that I think- shooting yeah. from the hip, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, 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 yeah, yeah. Hey, boo, boo, boo. But you know, I think, I think, I think there is merit here. And I think you can get into gray areas between like, what is monopoly power versus what is just not legal. And to me, the there's merit because, and I've said this on this show before. And so I was, I was pleased to really see it come out blatantly in the FTC statements. Mm -hmm. And it comes down to the price fix, price fixing that's potentially going yeah. on here. And then that is by punishing vendors based on the prices they're selling things at competitive retailers, or like you said, and even on their own websites, mm -hmm. because that is a number one fresh out of fresh buyer off the boat and buyer training the first thing they tell you not to do as a buyer your day one of of learning how to do merchandising you can't have those kinds of conversations so to your question at target like if i was like compelling my towel vendors in my first buyer job to be like hey i don't want you putting the price of these competitive towels that you're selling to walmart at you know four dollars I would right. lose my freaking job. Yeah. And so I went on the I went on the FTC website today to see how do they define price fixing so everyone can understand that because I think it's really interesting. And here it is. It's quote: Illegal price fixing occurs when whenever two or more competitors agree to take actions to raise, lower, maintain, or stabilize the price of any product or service. Price fixing schemes are often worked out in secret and can be hard to uncover, but an agreement can be discovered from quote circumstantial evidence end quote fully um so like that's essentially when you read it how they were working their website and demanding and placing products based on the what they were seeing as the competitive pricing position of these sellers on their site in a lot of ways it feels like that is happening to me and so that's why i am curious where this goes in the long run but what do you think ann yeah i mean i think there's there's a lot of questions that I have here, and I think it also comes down to the consumer, um, which is the the consumer you and I, but then also the SMBs that are on the platform too, and and kind of resetting expectations for the customer as well. Like you know, their Amazon's defense here is like, well, they're preventing us from getting fast delivery to our consumers because of, you know, like this FTC ban would or would force them to change the way that they're doing operations it for it it's higher prices for the consumers like i i think that this is not quite their defense is not quite strong here when it comes to those key items like you know reduced options like there's no that you're not reducing options there's more marketplaces right now that sellers have than ever like there's other opportunities and even you know d2c brands on their own websites have better opportunities if this is not in place so i think that there's a lot here that still needs to be ironed out. But ultimately, I think it gets back to what John said at the beginning here is that we need to establish a precedent for the other retailers that are coming into this space, TikTok, um, Shein, like all these other big marketplaces that are coming in here, whatever is happening here, as Amazon typically does, will set the stage for how those are managed going forward. That's a great point to close on. Yes, the rules of the road in regards to marketplaces, both from this angle, from you know preventing theft and organized crime, have to be reevaluated pretty quickly. All right, let's keep moving to headline number two. Kroger has begun construction on its own version of a Walmart super center. This is crazy. According to Supermarket News, the store will open in late 2024 and will be Kroger's largest store format at 124,000 square feet which is almost 55,000 square feet larger than an existing Kroger store. It will have a wider assortment from produce to kitchen appliances to clothing and jewelry. John, we're going to go back to you on this one because this is, again, in your wheelhouse being the grocery expert amongst the four of us. Um, no doubt it's a pretty bold move for Kroger. So should Target and Walmart be worried point blank? What do you think? Yeah, first of all, I think it's I think it's an awesome move by Kroger. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, I, think it's I think it's a really really great play by them generally. And to come to more directly to your question, should Walmart and Target be worried? I I would say that everyone should be worried about Kroger right now. Wow, um, they're I, I don't know if anyone is is both as ambitious as forward thinking and as aggressive about pr pursuing market share right now as Kroger are. Like they are. They're yeah. doubling down in all aspects of their business, right? So they're they're acquiring, they're expanding into new formats. Their their private label selection is really strong as we head into you know potential recession and people trading down. Like Kroger are well placed in kind of every set from that perspective. 
Um, and then you think about their leadership and how forward thinking they are and ambitious in terms of integrating technology into their, their organization. Like, I think they're a really fascinating company for how they're moving forward. So the easy answer is yes, I think both Walmart and Target should be worried, but I do think there is a nuance to that because it depends in which direction that Kroger go. Because if they're, if they really heavily pursue general merch, for example, I think Target should be very worried because that's like Target's bread and butter. It's how they, you know, how they fund everything else that happens within their store, right? But equally, if they go much more on the super center, offer everything you can possibly get under one roof, then Walmart should be worried. So I think there is two different directions that this can go. But overall, everybody in this space should be watching what Kroger are doing because they're coming for everyone at the moment. So they kind of are indiscriminately trying to take money from everyone on the table. And I think it's, yeah. a, it's a really interesting strategy they're pursuing right now. Interesting. This is going to be a fun discussion. So you think this is something to watch, to keep an eye on. All right, Anne, what do you think? What Do you agree with John? Disagree? What's your take? Absolutely. I agree. Really? Um, yes, because with some caveats. Okay, Rodney okay. McMullen, on, CEO of Kroger, on stage at Grocery Shop last week, talking about with the Albertsons merger, should it go through? They're going hard on lowest price possible in grocery. And I think when you look at the competitors, Target, not even close to a competitor in grocery products and produce and fresh. You look Fair. at Walmart, still more share than Target, but still not great. So if you can take the produce, the trip driver, that's going to get people in there day in and day out, you can start to bring in. Now, this is the key component, though. You have to figure out and have, having led the partnerships for Target Store of the Future, like you have to figure out how that general merchandise assortment is going to hit, because if it doesn't, then this fall, falls flat. And while Kroger does get a lot of accolades for getting out there and trying new stuff, it doesn't always work. So I think that's yes. going to be the key dependency. Like, can they do it? Can these additional footprints all over the country, should this merger go through, can that help them? Can they be the low price leader for grocery? Like, yes, yes, yes. But they have to be doing this better than Target better than Walmart. And that to me is the key like linchpin here. I a hundred percent agree with you. Yes. Low prices in grocery are different than low prices in a super center format that you're doing for the first yep. time. But so Kelly, what do you think? Do you agree with these two? Or do you think there's maybe a more doubting Thomas angle you would take? You can see which way I'm leading on this one already. I think so. I think I'm leaning similarly to you, Chris. I'm a little more skeptical of this and mostly for that last point that Ann just brought up. You know, when I think about Target expanding into grocery, Walmart expanding into grocery. It was just that they really already had the general merchandising right. down and mm -hmm. then moved into the, the food side. So I think it's a lot easier as a customer to jump onto, oh, now I can just get my groceries where I get my general merchandising versus, oh, Kroger sells my food. Now I'm supposed to buy a dresser from there. So I think it will be really critical to see who they're bringing in um, you know, in that initial marketplace model, but they do have so much equity and a great real estate profile. Like I'm not saying never, but I'm, I'm skeptical to see how they can really sell people that they mm -hmm. can make a play in this space. I want yes. that job. Yeah. That's yeah. Give fun job yeah. Give fun job yeah. I thought Kelly, I thought you said it really well. I mean, yeah, the, again, as a merchant, the proof is in the merchandising, which is what, and you're totally. to too, but I, for that reason, I'm not losing sleep on this. I mean, Kroger, I actually think Kroger feels late to the party on this. I mean, you already have Hy-Vee doing it. HEB is mm. doing it in Texas. I don't Meyer's think you can combine Hy-Vee and HEB aren't doing apparel though. Like yeah, not in there. Not, yeah, not to they, the extent that, that in their newer, in their newer stores there. Yes. But maybe not to the extent that this is, but it's pretty darn close. And then you still have Walmart and Target. And so like, why is Kroger going to do that any better than any of the myriad of options already out there? And and you also brought this up too. And their track record on this is crappy. I mean, I can remember a year ago, we were talking about them putting Bed Bath & Beyond in their stores and look how well that's turned out. So like, well, I just I just don't think there's anything in their track record that tells me they can do this any better than the other options that are already out there. So, I mean, that's the one, that, like that's one one option, one small floor pad thing. I mean, I think you have to reimagine yeah. this. This is like directly going after Target and Walmart. I don't even think you can put HEB and hy V in the same <clears throat> consideration set because they're not doing it in the same way. The boxes aren't the same size. Like it's, it's a different operation, but- for sure, Target and Walmart are competitors. You'll, I think, we just have to see if they can, like Kelly is saying, like get to the level of the, of quality of that merchandise assortment. John, yeah. last word here. 
Yeah, I mean, I think I think everything you said is correct, Chris, right? I mean, the execution of this depends on how the merchandise they put into the box, right? I mean, that's but that's the case for every retailer in every scenario. What I would say is that I think Kroger are thinking big in all directions, which which is why I'm so impressed by it, right? That the acquisition yeah. of Albertsons is so big and they're going for new formats. They're also, they're leading on in-store um, marketing. Like they are ahead of the game in a lot of areas. So I think that they, their track record in the last couple of years supports that they can execute this well. And they have a leadership team who are willing to go after things, which is why I think it's such a great strategy overall. Yeah. Great, great, great conversation. Yes, and and don't forget, before you get to the headline, they also have the Krogies, which was the another Krogies. start, another great start. I know, I was like, from this, Kroger. Is, this is what we should do. We should take our money that we save from registering for Manifest, the $800, and we yes. should each place a bet, and then we'll come back to each other and see like what, what happened yeah, when it opened in 2024. Today. Yeah. Yes, right. All right. All right, let's go to headline number three. So Nike is now selling refurbished sneakers online. Uh, according to nicekicks.com, Nike has Ooh. launched refurbish.nike.com. The program is reportedly part of Nike's circular consumer offering, which takes gently worn, like new, or slightly imperfect footwear, refurbished, but refurbished them by hand, and then sells them to cus customers at select Nike stores and now online. So here is a breakdown of how the refurbished plan works. So customers will return shoes to Nike as they do. Nike experts inspect and grade the footwear. Then each eligible pair is carefully cleaned and sanitized. And the refurbished shoes are then returned to stores or sold online at a reduced price. Kelly, we're going to go to you first on this one. Is this something that you would have advised Nike to do? Absolutely. I yeah. think this is a, a great idea on Nike's part and really two main reasons. Uh, the first is the market. And then the second is especially what we're seeing in the consumer right now. So mm -hmm. resale market, like first thing I think of when I hear resale is sneakers. Yeah. Then handbags, because that's, that's what I'm shopping for. Right. But, um, but the massive, it's a massive market. Nike is the major player in terms of products in the market, you just think about the amount of Jordans going on resale. So it's mm -hmm. honestly kind of crazy to me that they haven't started making a direct play to retail in this space yet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just massive cakers right now in the industry. I think, you know, 16% is what I was reading today um, for sneaker resale, as opposed to just the shoe market itself right. growing at about five. So there's a ton of opportunity. And I think you know, historically, there's been a lot of even premiumizing products through that resale channel. Right. Right now, I think we're seeing it's more of a, you know, savings play for the consumer, but people are hungry for that right now. Um, off price consignment are growing considerably as people are looking for a more affordable option to the brands they love. So I think it's it's really win-win for Nike and they've been investing in their ability to serve this space already with Nike Fit, their right. app. So uh, I'm really excited to see how this takes off for them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think I think the this is the first step, right? Like get the Nike product in the returns and then, you know, start to go into managing a reseller platform because that's a, that's a thing about this that really surprised me. It was like we're not seeing a resale component to this yet. It's just returns coming in, but it's setting the stage I think for that. Chris, you're the biggest yeah. sneakers drop person that I know. Like what you're super excited about this, I imagine, but yeah, tell me. Yeah, I am totally a hundred percent. No, I love it. I think, you know, returns are a major problem. This helps solve that. It gets you some revenue off of what is a growing problem for all of retail. Um, the only thing I would say about it is, you know, I went on it as for, as soon as I heard about it, I jumped on it and the inventory is really light. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's a website too, you know, and, and this is something where if it was an app, like the sneakers app, like the Nike app, I'd be on it every week. But, right. you know, so I hope they go in that direction and actually make it a standalone app or make it easily accessible within one of those apps as well. Um, that's the one thing I would advise because right now, you know, it's a little lacking from like desirability in terms of shoppability, in terms of what's there. But net, net, long term, I love where they're going with this. Absolutely love it. Yeah. John, how about you? Are you all in? Yeah, I mean, I'm all in on it too. I think I think it's it's kind of a classic no brainer, right? I mean, um, I even though I'm not one, I know that the term sneakerhead is obviously very common. So there's a lot of people who are like super focused on this area. They really want the latest trends, but also may not always be able to access them. The other, so so it's great from that perspective of bringing more consumers in who may not always have been able to get access to that stuff and then build your brand equity. 
The other point here that is an obvious one, but I think it should be touched on, is the fact that this is great for sustainability. I mean, Nike mm-hmm. don't have a great track record from a sustainability perspective. Sneakers have always been viewed as disposable. Mm-hmm. And this can change that conversation to make it that it's actually circular now and that they're pay- t- making an effort to be more sustainable, which is becoming a topic, but will, as we get, as Gen Z take more part of the, of the share, uh, sorry, more of market share and more buying power, that is going to become a huge topic. So they're getting ahead of what I think will be important for them in the next five to 10 years too. Love it. Good job, Nike. All right, let's go on to headline number four. All right. Best Buy has launched a new promotional program called Best Buy Drops. I can't wait to talk about this one. I think this is going to be another fun conversation. According to Chain Store Age, the program launched on Wednesday and the campaign provides discounts on items such as product releases, limited runs, and launches all in real time. Each drop is only available in limited quantities and exclusively through the Best Buy app. Drops will include special products and deals from a variety of categories, including gaming consoles and accessories, wearable devices, e-transportation products, that's an important category, small appliances, smart home, and toys. And multiple drops will occur every week during the holiday season. For example, tomorrow, Friday, September 29th, shoppers can save $250 on the Atari VCS 800 all-in gaming bundle. The drop price is $149.99, but if you are a Plus and Best Buy total member, you can save even more as you can get the Atari for just $99. Pretty smoking deal. Can we pause there? Like Atari, that's a thing now again? Uh, oh yeah, dude, come on. And get, get with the, get with the, get <laughs> No, with I'm the, asking. I know you the, are a video game expert, oh, yes, not an FTC course. expert, but a video game expert. Like $99, <laughs> nostalgia for $99. Sign so me that's up, what it man. is. This is like another Atari. That's what you're yeah, telling me. I, I have no idea actually, and I'm just guessing that it's a basically a nostalgic play for all the <laughs> all the Gen X. Well, I'm intrigued. I didn't still realize some it was way, coming back, but yeah. Still need some way to relate to their kids, yeah. That's what I'm guessing <laughs> this is. But so Kelly, my, it's a great point. Kelly, my question for you is what do you think of this concept? Do you think it's a shrewd merchandising move, or do you think it is just a copycat gimmick, similar to what we've seen from Nike in the previous headline? Yeah, good question. So I'm feeling I'm leaning more copycat, but really almost, almost less Nike and more Amazon. Just thinking more broadly okay. about the the holiday season okay. rather than you know the drops kind of culture. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's a bad move. I actually think it's a could be a pretty favorable move. Um, okay, so it's a good copycat. A good copycat, yes. Okay. Especially for Best Buy, with you know, especially starting last year, Amazon has really redefined that holiday promotional calendar by introducing a second prime day in October. And we see Best Buy is starting their deals tomorrow in the month of September. I think they even had one yesterday on Apple Watch, which I was sad to have missed. Um, Yes. So, and you know, I think especially for the tech space and gaming electronics, that's when people are really looking for a deal, especially for the holiday season. So we used to have this game of who can offer the steepest discounts on Black Friday. And now that really seems to be shifting to who can offer the earliest deals. So it's just, it's pulling that forward. But I think this could work in the sense that if they can make it a little bit more of an exciting promotional drop, uh, that's happening earlier rather than just going for the steepest discounts come Black Friday, um, it might actually help out their margins a little bit during the season. Yeah, that's a great point because what you're getting at too is is also part of this too is who can have the most flexibility in their promotional schedule during exactly. the holiday season, which this helps out a lot. And you and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, actually for quite a while. I got pretty yeah. geeked up by it, as you can probably tell already, but what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I I definitely see your points. I think you need to go through like all of the the underlying things that we're probably not seeing in the headlines here. But I think for Best Buy, like what Kelly was saying, like it's a great way to get people to download your app and then see some of the other benefits that you offer, like scan and go in store or like locker pickup and all the other things that you can do inside the app that people probably yeah, wouldn't you're know. Like you're, more. I think most people are conditioned to kind of going to the the dot com site for Best Buy than they are, you know, downloading the the um, retailer app, but I think you could also start to see how they could apply this gamification and including some of their other initiatives. Like I'd like to see them do this in conjunction with like their virtual store team or something to kind of make this more dynamic mm. down the road. Um, but 
like to Kelly's point, like the Apple watch so was sold out by 1 PM yesterday. Yep. So it must be working, but I mean, what are your, you, you need to like preach now. I'm like, you why? want me to go next? I mean, All you, right. you're <laughs> like, you're like writing 15 articles about this yesterday already. I, was, I know I was going to go to John. Amazon. Yeah. I'm probably going to write an article about this. Cause I actually, I don't, I think, I, I think, I think Kelly, actually the way you summed it up is really good. It, it is a copycat, but it's, it's like a very good, smart copycat. It's like a pivot on what we've seen before. So, you know, I think it takes the Nike drop concept, but it adapt or even the Amazon's concepts, like you said, but it adapts it to what Best Buy needs most, which is creating urgency and demand for the key items during the selling season. And moreover, it does it in a way, like you said, that gives Best Buy the ultimate flexibility to talk about the products they want to talk about around the noise of Black Friday, Prime Day, Cyber Monday, name your freaking holiday here over the <laughs> next, you know, two months. And they can do these whenever it wants. It can price them whenever they want. And then it can still determine what's the best price to clear the stock out on those big days when you have everyone's attention. So net net, I think it's a great innovation for Best Buy. It makes them more flexible. It improves their sell throughs in, in, in theory. It gives them better margins on these products. And these are the items, the other part that Ann and I talked about yesterday, these are the items that make or break your holiday season. So if you can get yeah. them in front of your consumers before other people at the price totally. that is most optimal for you, that is a huge win-win. So yeah. yeah, it's copycatting, but it's adapting something to your business, which is what Best Buy consistently does better than anyone else. And that's why they stay in the game. But John, anything you'd add here? Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with everyone's points overall. And I know that everyone's real bought in on it. Um, I, I, this one kind of left me a bit cold, I have to say. I mean, Go ahead, go ahead. I mean, yes, I love this. Go ahead. I mean, I mean, like, I'll say, Chris, when you were reading it, I, I don't think it was just your delivery. I got a bit lost <laughs> about what actually the point of this is, right? Okay, uh, yeah. It, too. it was just... For it wasn't me, my this, accent. That's good. Okay, yeah, good. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but, but for me, it's just, it's a promotional strategy, right? Which is great. It's great. And, and I get it. And I think Best Buy are, first of all, like an awesome company for all the reasons that you guys have outlined. I think they're innovative. They do a lot of stuff in terms of omni-channel um, retailing. But for me, this is just, hey, we're offering discounts on electronics. And guess who else is offering discounts on electronics? Target and Amazon and Walmart. Like everybody's doing this in a certain way. And I, I get your point as well, Anne, that, okay, something sold out early yesterday, so it must be working. But we don't know if they just put yeah. 10 on the website, right? And then they sold sure. 10 Apple Watches. So it is a good way to create some excitement and demand. But I really don't see it as that, quote unquote, innovative, right? I mean, Amazon has been doing drops on Black Friday for mm -hmm. five years, right? You click on Black Friday, they do like this 30 minute deal. Yep. So I think they're just pulling it forward by two weeks. And then next year, someone else is going to pull it forward by a week. And then next year, they're going to do it again. And then suddenly we're just going to have discounts all through the year. So yep. it feels a little bit like a race to the bottom. And I know that we say that it's going to protect margin, but ultimately these discounts are going to get built into the prices when they plan out their year. So I, I, I think it's cool in some ways, but it hasn't got me so excited. Got it. It's, got it. It's so you're not, a little more tempered than I am, John. Yeah. That's great. But, yeah, yeah, I was really, I was really happy about everything else. It's just this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Well, let's try to make you happier on this last. It's a great headline. show. This is a good um, show. All right. All right. Headline number five: Albertsons has introduced a new service called Flash, designed to provide online order pickup and delivery in as little as thirty minutes. According to Chain Storage, Albertsons customers can place Flash orders via its website and apps at the same cost as purchasing an item in store. Shoppers can select up to thirty-five items for Flash pickup or delivery, and when choosing Flash, their orders will be delivered within a thirty to fifty-minute window, or ready for pickup at their local store in thirty minutes or less. Members of the company's Fresh Pass delivery subscription program will receive complimentary flash pickup service and a discounted flash delivery fee of $2 per order. All other customers can utilize flash pickup for just $3.95 per order or flash delivery for $11.95 per order. John, you are a resident grocery expert on this show today. If we break this down, is Albertsons just essentially charging for 30 minute pickup. Do you think we're going to see other retailers go in this direction? Like what, what do we, what do we make of this headline? Yeah. It's a, I, I say when we get to grocery, this is one of my favorite topics because um, yeah. somewhere along the way, somebody decided that customers need products in 30 minutes. I don't know who decided that. Right. But <laughs> I, and I don't know where the demand is coming from or what it is, but it's a big topic that everyone wants things in 15 or 30 minutes. But we've, it's repeatedly been shown that it's not possible because yeah. every order loses money. 
and you're in an industry that's already way for thin on margins. So why have we decided that we're going to create this kind of process that's just going to lose a load of money for these retailers? So I think what Albertsons has said is great. If you want something in 30 minutes, that's, that's awesome. And it's, I'm happy for you, but you got to pay for it because it costs us money, right? Yeah. So I think it's a, it's a very clear pl- like decision by Albertsons to say, we can offer you same day pickup or two hour pickup or whatever for no cost because that doesn't cost us a lot of money. But if you want it faster, you got to pay for it. So I think a lot of people are going to move in this direction. Um, and it, it's just totally logical for me that you charge for something that costs you so much more money. Yeah. Albertsons are just ahead of the curve. I don't know. Like I said, I'm, I got a bit kind of worked up on this topic because it, it became this like buzzword for a couple of years that everyone wants to deliver things fast. And then they just, we, there were some reports that people were losing like 200 bucks in order, right? To get this right. stuff working. It just, it, it was a fallacy from the beginning and this proves it. Mm-hmm. And um, so I think it's just an, an easy decision by Albertsons. And if they're, if they're the last people to do it, I'd be really surprised. Yeah. Chris? How about you? Yeah, I mean, I would actually, I would agree with John and then actually maybe even raise the stakes a little bit. I think Ooh. the interesting thing about this announcement is we've seen a rash of announcements that are similar to this. And by that, I mean, retailers charging for things that used to be free. Mm-hmm. So yeah. like just this past week, you have Amazon now charging to keep ad-free Prime, which is really, they're $2.99 to keep ad-free Prime. Zara and H&M now charging for returns. You know, those are just some of the recent examples. So I kind of think this is only the beginning. And these announcements are heralding this age where I think the e-convenience free lunch may soon be over is how mm-hmm. I would phrase that up. And so I like, I wouldn't be surprised if you actually start seeing some retailers, maybe not all, but some even charging for a curbside pickup, because mm-hmm. there is an added expense to that than just coming in your store to shopping. So I've made the comparison before, and I think it's very appropriate here that it's kind of like the airlines in the past, you know, you've got, especially in the grocery industry, you've got, mm-hmm. you've got a business model that is under pressure. And therefore, the economics of it, you need to find new ways to do it. And so you're going to have to adapt to survive. And the one way you can adapt to survive, like the airlines, is you start to charge more for the value-added services that people want. It's the same thing that's happened in that industry for the past 20 or 30 years. I think this may be the start of seeing it happen in the grocery industry in particular. Yeah, I think the airline comparison is so good, Chris, because you it's also like something that they can lever up or down and or right. implement things like they're talking about here, where if you have the subscription to Albertson's program, like then you get free delivery the same way you would if you're yeah. a, a premium customer in an airline or something. So I think that that makes sense that they're they're just trying this to see what happens. Does it decline? Do people even want it? Like John's saying, um, mm-hmm. Kelly, what would you throw in here? Yeah, I would totally agree with Chris here. I think that grocers, and it's not just grocery, even we're seeing it on the retail side, apparel, you know, people haven't figured out the best way to optimize this e-commerce model. Margins have been shrinking, especially as people try to increase the services that they're offering. So I think this is just one example of many ways people are trying to figure it out. So I, I definitely think that will continue. But I think that's, I think that makes complete sense. I, the last thing I'd throw in here too, and John, then I'll I'll get back to you for the last word. But the other thing I think could be really interesting here that is not about the consumer necessarily here and the speed of pickup, but also like, I think it'd be really interesting to see what they learn and how much is involved from prioritizing these 30 minute orders. And then when you start to think about like a place like Costco, where like, could you fulfill a 30 minute, could you put in your 30 minute order, but you still want the discovery experience. So like you walk in and you shop for 30 minutes and then you're picking Mm. up your order on your way out. Like, I think that there's other things operationally that these retailers can learn from trying to fulfill in this shorter time domain and still provide like an an in-store experience perhaps, or it's, you know, if you pick it up in store, you don't have to pay the fee, but you, it's still ready in 30 minutes. Like, I think there's a lot of, of experimentation that could happen in this, but John, I'll give you the last word here. I also think that it's a, it's a trend that we're seeing in, in grocery, but all in like food in general, of trying to bring the consumer back to physical retail. Yeah. Because um, when you're shopping online, this is like, it's a little anecdotal, but if you're shopping online, you can make very clear decisions of, well, I don't want to pay four bucks for that one. I can pay three bucks for this. Mm-hmm. So you're losing the impulse and we are seeing fairly consistently 
that the margin, the gross margin right. in those online baskets is lower than the gross margin in the in-store baskets. Yes. And so this is another way to try and say to people, well, you're going to pay extra for it, but then you should come to the store instead and we can try and get more margin out of you that way. Yeah. So I think that's also part of this play to bring people back in for impulse purchases too. All right. Yeah. I, I, oh, I, the other thing I'd say, and too, is like, just to close it out, like, this this headline was really interesting for those listening too. Like it, it's a, it's about a week old, but Ann and I were looking through the headlines, and it both caught our attention mm -hmm. for the reason that we said. And it was great to have a discussion about it too. I think Ann, like in terms of hearing everyone's points here, because it it's it does sound like it's it's more important than it probably was given credit for in the media at the time. And Absolutely, it, everyone's shaking their head in agreement on that. All right, let's close it out and go to the lightning round. Kelly, all this right. is your first lightning round question of Excited. all time. Not your last, though. Um, <laughs> I want to know, Central Perk Coffee House is about to open in Boston, influenced by the coffee shop of the same name from Friends. What fictional sitcom spot do you wish would be created into a real-life place that you could visit? Oh, see, at first you started to say fictional, and my mind went, Hogwarts but if we're going fic oh. fictional sitcom oh that's a tough one I mean I think, I'll, I'll, I think I can one... give you Hogwarts but if you do if you have another yeah. one you let me yeah. you let us know one comes to mind uh I was always a big Parks and Rec person yeah um, oh yeah so there's Great that show. episode where um Entertainment 720 they have the new like <laughs> experiential media business which is like very vague and ominous and they just have this huge party i think i would want the uh entertainment 720 lounge yes i love a, that to be a real place you can go to the real hogwarts you know they have like a replica yeah. in new york Kelly. <laughs> they they do right yes that, that was so example. that dream Orlando. can come true we got to <laughs> worry about the experience 721 i don't think that one's in in construction yet but awesome all right, John, the next one, which sometimes the stars just align so perfectly when we have guests on the show, but Southeast Technical University in County Carlo, Ireland, plans to offer a Bachelor of Arts in content creation and social media. John, which social media influencer would you most like to be a guest lecturer if you were to take this course? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I actually did see this headline before before um, you brought it up. So um, I went I probably will go even more Irish. So right now the Irish rugby team are playing in the in the World Cup. Okay. And one one of their players is called Peter Omani, and you guys should look him up. He's uh, his Instagram feed. It's all about like gardening and cleaning his house. And so he's this big like six foot three like huge guy, and then it shows he literally gets like scissors out to cut to trim the edge of his grass. And it's like oh weirdly OCD. It's weirdly OCD, but he's got like a hundred thousand followers, and everybody watches him like cutting his grass. So I would like, go sure. that direction. He's like he's like pruning his peonies or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, like, like, that's yeah it's like like I get sent stuff from my sister and like cleaning tips from Peter Armani. It's bizarre. So. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> yeah. wonderful. Yeah. yeah. All right, John. We're going back to you. Amazon is expanding the program to help sellers redesign their packaging so that it can be shipped without requiring an additional box. What is one product or company you wish would partake in this program? Yeah, I so the first thing that can't comes to mind is uh like a uh, toy packaging. You know that mm. like um the like vacuum sealed toy packaging that you yes. have to get like the industrial scissors to cut yes. open and like your kids are screaming at you because they want to play with the toy and then you like cut your finger on it. Mm -hmm. I hate that packaging. <laughs> so if we could somehow change that. I don't know how to make it better, but that would be that would be my push. A hundred percent. I don't know what they do, but yes, that needs to be repaired immediately. Yeah. Whoever like, created that should never create packaging ever again. Yeah, it's like Fort Knox. All right, Kelly, last one. Amazon sellers are reportedly raiding dollar stores for products like glow sticks and Twinkies to resell online. Kelly, what is one product you cannot live without and would gladly pay a huge markup for online if Amazon were the only place you could get it? This is a fun one. I think the first one that comes to mind for me is white out. And it's something that I never, <laughs> I am a huge physical note taker, but I also hate it when you have to, you know, go back, scratch it out. So I'm a, I'm a big white out user, accepting sponsorships. <laughs> um, if I could get that easy from Amazon, I, I would pay a huge markup. Oh my oh gosh. My I already God. do get it there. But. Kelly, you are a giant nerd. I that just you've exposed I your know. nerddom. Both You're welcome. Answers. You are welcome on this podcast with your fellow nerds anytime. But that might be the most nerdy answer we've ever had in the history of Amazon. That is the greatest it. answer in the history thank of the show. You, and I imagine you. your colleagues at the AM Consumer and Retail Group are going to give you quite the grief for that over the course <laughs> of the next week. And and well, they should too, I will add. 
All right. Well, that closes us up. Happy birthday today to Hillary Duff, Naomi Watts, and to the woman who could probably teach me a thing or two about social media, Miss Olivia Jade herself. And remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it Omni Talk, the only retail media outlet run by two former executives from a current top 10 U.S. retailer. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our twice weekly newsletter tells you the top five things you need to know each day and also features special content that, ex that is exclusive to us. And we do it all just for you. And we try really hard to make it fit within the preview pane of your inbox. You can sign up today at www.omnitalk.blog. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. And Kelly, if people enjoyed our conversation today, want to get in touch with you or John, or maybe get in touch with the a and Consumer and Retail Group, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, absolutely. You know, check us out on LinkedIn, Alvarez and Marcel Consumer and Retail Group, or visit us at our website, Alvarez and Marcel CRG.com. And you can meet our team and we would be so excited to connect with you. Awesome. Well, it's great having both of you, John, Kelly. Thanks for being with us. Your first time, you did great. It was a great conversation all throughout. Really quick paced show. Loved it. And so on behalf of John, Kelly, Ann, and myself, and all of us at OmniTalk Retail, as always, be careful out there. The OmniTalk Fast Five is brought to you in association with the A&M Consumer and Retail Group. The A&M Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients, people, and communities toward their maximum potential. CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator-like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Firework. Firework is the largest video commerce solution built for the world's leading brands. They empower brands with shoppable and live stream video on their own websites where people like to shop. Put your commerce in motion with Firework. You can find out more at firework.com. And SPS Commerce. SPS Commerce is redefining how businesses across the supply chain operate in an omni-channel world. Their experts, tech, and data work together to fuel your growth and deliver for your customers. To find out more, head to spscommerce.com. And finally, Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four interest-free payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit Sezzle.com.